അതിനെ ഡോക്ടർ സുബ്രഹ്മണ്യം സ്വാമി ഇൻ പെർസെപ്ഷൻ 
people who came from outside never talked about Maharashtra or uh, Takatiya in Andhra or Chodas in Tamil Nadu. They spoke about India, Hindustan. And this concept is, although we were all so many Rajas, Rani, so on, but there was a uniting concept. Mahabharat was fought in Kurukshetra. At least uh, more than 1,500 kings came to fight that war. Some on large number on side of the Kauravas and a small number on the side of the Kandavas. And from all over India they came. Even the Travancore Raja came to Kurukshetra to participate in the Mahabharata war. Of course, when he saw two families fighting with each other, he decided he would not participate in the war, but he will set up tents on both sides to prepare food for the soldiers. Because in our system, fighting will start when the sun rises, and the fighting will terminate when the sun sets, and then it will be in an open medan, not in the cities, or in kasbas, or in agriculture fields, but open fields, and at night you will go back to your tent and return the next day. This is the civilized way we were fighting. But we fought fiercely. The Gujarat kings defeated the, the most fierce caliphate, the caliph of the, the third caliphate, the name was Umar. He had gone and conquered Europe up to Spain. And then he declared that he's sending his army to India. The Gujarat kings, along with the Rajasthani kings, they met these, the Umar's uh, forces in Sindh and defeated them there, 700 and 780. And for almost another 700 years, you never heard of the caliphs again. That's the history. Over the years, the the fighting of a fighting spirit of our country, which is not reported in our history books, was tremendous. The Islamic forces came originally through a betrayal of Jai Chan, who, uh, because of the constant insults of his son-in-law, decided to help Gauri. And Gauri was coronated in 1192 in Delhi. And essentially, the Islamic rule started after that. But even then, the every part of India kept fighting. <clears throat> and the last blow was given by the Marathas in Pune, where they defeated the Mughals. But by then, these years and years of fighting had weakened us. And fighting all corners of India, the south in south, the Ma the uh, Tirumala Nayakas, the Kocholas, the Pandyas, Kakatiyas in Andhra, uh, a home dynasty in Assam, a home dynasty which is consist of people who originally came from Thailand and then settled down, became Hindus, set up a Hindu empire, and the Mughals tried to go over into Southeast Asia through Assam. For six times they made an effort, all six times they were defeated. It's, there, it's not there in our history books. Because history books have not been written by Indians. They've been written by Britishers. And that needs to be changed now. If you want a new India, you need new Indian history books based on the truth. <laughs> Guru Gobind Singh, he broke the back of the Mughal Empire. Shivaji, of course, the glorious reign of Shivaji. So all the parts of India fought. And that is why many times when I have gone to Islamic countries and met scholars, they ask me one question. Why is it that India is still 82% Hindu? I say, why? Why you ask this question? They said, Iran was 100% Zoroastrian. Islamic invasion converted that country into 100% Islamic in just 15 years. 
the neighboring countries of Mesopotamia and Babylon, which now are known as Iraq. We convert the Islamic invasions, captured that lands, and converted the population to 100% Islam in 17 years. Egypt was converted in, into 100% Islam in 21 years. Europe was converted to Christianity in 50 years. But in your country, 600-700 years of Islamic rule and 200 years of Christian rule through the British and you are still 82%. What is the secret there? The secret was that we kept fighting. And after the debilitation, the British came in 1815, they defeated the Marathas. And then they went on slowly to get control of India. But even then, after 1857, in 1857, the whole of India revolted. And that is why Savarkar wrote the first classic book called 1857, The First War of Indian Independence. And that led to an awakening. And then, of course, these spiritual gurus like Sri Arvindo, Swami Vivekananda, and so on, they all woke India up. And slowly, slowly, India again got on its feet. And finally, we defeated the British who had to leave. So let us know first, if you want to talk about New India, know your true history. We are committed to it, those of us who believe in India as a modern nationalist state, we want the correct history to be told to us. We have been told for years that India is a land of two races, Aryans and Dravidians. Where is the evidence for it? Recent evidence based on DNA which is the most scientifically available method of determining whether you belong to one race or another. The Journal of Genetics in Cambridge University, Journal of Genetics in Mysore, in Houston, in US, all of them have published research to say that from Kashmir to Kanyakumari, from Jamnagar to Dibrugar, all Indians have the same DNA. People mistake skin color for a difference in race. Skin color has got nothing to do with race. It has got to do with pigmentation in your skin. And therefore, race-wise, India is only one race. There is no Aryan, there is no Dravidian. Aryan, there is no such word in Sanskrit literature. <coughs> Arya is there. That means only a civilized person. Any person can be Arya. And all we are addressed is Arya. Arya, Putra, and so on. Dravida was a word coined by Adi Shankara when he went from south to north, challenging every pandit on the way, Buddhist pandit on the way, to a Shastra, which meant, if I win the debate, you convert to my religion. If you lose, uh, if I lose the debate, I convert to your religion. And he won and won and won and Finally, when he was in Bihar, he met the topmost scholar of both the Uttaravan Vamsa school and Buddhist theology, Mandara Mishra. And he said, he challenged him to a debate. During the debate, he was asked this question, who are you? He said, I'm Dravida Shishu. Shishu means child. Dravida, he explained, is a sandhi of two words, Dra and Vid which means where the three coastlines meet. That means South India. And now the British came and they gave us a totally different thing. That first the Dravidians used to lose, uh, rule India. And then the Aryans came through the Khyber Pass, beat the hell out of the Dravidians and drove them south. <laughs> and that became history. And a political movement called DMK, Dravida Munetra Karagam, Dravida Progressive Foundation started and all kinds of rubbish was being put out. The DMK began celebrating Ravan Leela on the grounds that Rama came from the north. He was an Aryan. 
and uh, Ravana was our Dravidian king. Well, I put the Karnanidhi wise to it by saying Ravana was originally born near Delhi, a place called Noida, where there is a, even today a village called Misra. He went to Kailash, did puja to Lord Shiva, and he gave him, Shiva Bhuranath gave him a vat, that is a boon. With that boon he went and captured Sri Lanka, which was then being ruled by his cousin Guber. That's how he became king. So therefore, uh, Karnanidhi had to stop celebrating Ravan Leela afterwards. <laughs> when especially when he found out that Ravan was a Brahmin actually. <laughs> but he did not give up abusing Rama. I remember when I was arguing against the demolition of this Rama Setu, Karnanidhi got very upset because he was in favor of that project. He said, who is this Swami to call this Rama Setu? Did Ram build it? Does he have an engineering degree? From which college he has an engineering degree? Try to make fun like that. Next day he fell ill. So he had to be admitted to hospital. And the hospital's name was Ramakrishna Medical <laughs> Hospital. So I asked him, does Rama have an MBBS? Are you sure? I wrote him a letter. And this is the way <coughs> the British, unlike the Mughals, who use their physical strength against us, the British not only use their firepower, but they also brainwashed our mind. Yes. And a new India cannot come about unless this brainwashing is finished, is removed. I've often in meetings, including here in Mumbai, said, then mindset is the most important thing for New India. You must have what is called as a Virat mindset, a Virat Mansha. Otherwise you cannot have a New India. And no matter how many millions of people we are, we are 130 crore people today, but that's not enough if the mindset is not there. 1,000 goats stand in one place. And one tiger comes, the numbers are with the goats. But yet that one tiger scares them so much that they all start running here and there. Same thing with, same thing with strength. In a circus you will see in a cage, five strong lions, well-fed lions. One thin ringmaster will enter, and he will order these lines, climb up on the table. They will all climb up. He say, open your mouth, they will all open their mouth. He will put his head in each one of them. And all of us who are watching the circus will cheer. The question is why these lions don't bite his head off? Because they have been brought up from the time they were cubs to obey. That is why it's important that your strength is not enough. You may have nuclear bombs, you may have a large enemy, uh, army, but unless your mindset is one of knowing your strength and working according to that, you will never be able to be ever be peacefully able to progress in your country. And I've seen this in real life. People used to ask me why Manmohan Singh obeyed Sonia Gandhi. I said, because he's a circus singh, he's not a real singh. <laughs> Why did he have to listen? She was nothing. And he was prime minister. But that power didn't mean anything to him because his mind was terrified of her. So I begin by saying today that we can rebuild our country into a new India when our people become aware of what we are. What is your true history? Only country in the world which defeated the Islamic invasion and retained its civilization. In 1947, we defeated the British. How we defeated, that's, that's a question I'm not going to, whether it was Subhash Chandra Bose's INA, which created a new psychology amongst our military, 
when the British got scared. Of course, the British Prime Minister actually came to India after he ceased to be Prime Minister to Calcutta to give a speech in Hindat. He said, Gandhi was only useful because you could hand over power to him. But the real reason we left is not because of Quit India Movement, because that was a failure. We left because Subhash Chandra Bose's INA infected our army and the army began to revolt, the navy began to revolt. <laughs> and we knew that the day the army doesn't obey us, we have no future and that's why we left. Otherwise we won the World War II. There was no need for us to leave India. That history is still not being written. Because even we don't know how Sebastian the Bose died. Those papers are still not being fully declassified. Mm. But I'm saying to you that that victory was ours. The British, before leaving, created Pakistan. And in the, the way to create Pakistan, because there was, there was no Pakistan there, at that time, so they had to create a Pakistan for which they brought a bill in the House of Commons. And in that House of Commons, they said, our goal is to take United India and create two countries, one a Muslim-administered Pakistan and a Hindu-administered India. And Ambedkar pounced on that and said, if we accept this, then we must have population exchange. Ambedkar was a great scholar. People used to call him, uh, uh, a congressman used to call him Bhimra. Despite the fact that he had a PhD in economics from Columbia from in 1916, despite the fact that he had a DSC from London School of Economics, despite the fact that he had a law degree from London, he was called Bhimra. But Jawaharlal Nehru went to Cambridge and failed. I don't think any Nehru has ever passed any exam. <laughs> <laughs> One tried to pass it off that she had got a degree from Cambridge and then I found out by going to Cambridge to give a lecture that she was never a student there. And then later on she said it was a printing mistake and stopped using that in her parliamentary biography as well as in the election uh, election returns in the, the, the form. I'm saying therefore we didn't respect uh, uh, Ambedkar despite the fact he was such a scholar. He was given the charge of moving every amendment and getting the constitution adopted. Constitution had three great men. Rajendra Prasad as president of the constituent assembly Sardar Patel as chairman of the Fundamental Rights Committee and uh, Ambedkar as the chairman of the drafting committee. Jawaharlal Nehru was nowhere. His only contribution to the constitution was to bring Article 370 into it. <laughs> and that also he didn't have the nerve to move himself. He asked uh, uh, Sheikh Abdullah, the father of Farooq Abdullah, to go and speak to Ambedkar. Ambedkar said, I will never allow 370 in the constitution. I am not a traitor, so I will not move it. Then Jawaharlal Nehru prevailed on the soft heart of Sardar Patel and got Gopal Sami Ainga to move it. And uh, Sardar Patel gave an assurance. Article 370 is only for a brief period because Jawaharlal Nehru has gone to the UN and he wants to say that we have not yet finalized it, it is still a dispute. But it is going on and on. We can still remove 370 in no time. It doesn't need a parliament vote. It just needs the president's notification that 370 is here, hereby deleted. But our government has still not come around to doing it. Uh, but that doesn't mean we won't do it in the future. It has to be done. We want one India. But I am saying to you that please understand your legacy. You must know the true history of India. You must know its glories, what is to be celebrated. 
Today the world is celebrating yoga. In India, after the British left, we did not do it. It is after the demonstration by many foreigners, particularly Hollywood actresses, that yoga became a subject in the late 1960s, a thing that is fashionable to do. And now, of course, it's become commonplace. Sanskrit, every time we say Sanskrit should be learned, people used to laugh, oh, what is this? This is a dead language. Today, it has been established and you can go to Google and type and find out. NASA has, after 20 years of research, come to the conclusion that for artificial intelligence, the storing of knowledge in a computer is best done when you use Sanskrit, no other language. You go to Google, you'll find that there is a school in London called St. John's School. And that school, they have made it compulsory that children, and these are all English children, English, white English children, all these children, they are only boys' school, so all the boys between the age of 6 and 11, every day, in the morning, for half an hour, will recite Sanskrit shlokas. If you don't believe it, go and see it in Google, St. John's School. And why? Because the principal says that according to his, exper his, exper his research, if you recite certain Sanskrit shlokas, between the ages of 6 to 11 every day, then your brain development is far superior than the development of anybody else. This is, this is our, our legacy, but we, are not, we don't know about it. Others are discovering it. Ayurveda today is being discovered, rediscovered, I should say. So I'm saying in this new India, you don't have to be a new country, you are an ancient country. This is a country which is a continuing civilization, the Hindu civilization. Yes, there have been people who have come here. If they came peacefully, we looked after them. The, uh, the Parsis came, they were butchered everywhere in the world. After uh, Islam overran Iran, and in India they lived in, in peace, and even uh, with full freedom to do what they wanted. When the British left India, they met the Parsi leaders and said, you are a small community, this Hindu community is huge, they will swallow you. So like for the Anglo-Indians, we have given some reservations in the parliament and the, an assembly, we will do that for you also. They said for a thousand years the Hindus have looked after us when nobody was looking after us and we have nothing to fear from them. If you go, we will be okay with the Hindus. The Jews also. They were persecuted everywhere in the world. They came to India, we built their synagogues in Cochin and Bombay. We looked after them. Some of them rose to great heights, like the General Jacob, who liberated Bangladesh for us. They were, people were happy when Israel was founded. After their constitution was adopted, a resolution was passed in the, in the Israeli parliament. Thank you, India. You are the only country where the Jews were not persecuted in the world. Oh. <laughs> and today, all these left-wing people are teaching us secularism. <laughs> our country by nature, our religion, is a secular religion in the sense. It says all religions lead to God. We don't say that all religions lead with equal speed to God. We think <laughs> Hindus' speed is the best. We go by highway, they go by village roads. That's the difference. But at the same time, you do attain God, and we accept all gods. So in that situation, to be told that development of Hindu religion or Hindu consciousness is intolerance is the most ridiculous thing that could happen. So how do we come out of all this? Yeah. We have to come out of it by a number of routes. First of all, this cheap imitation of the West must stop. Yes, we have been fed with this baggage. When Macaulay came, he made it a rule, Sanskrit will be wiped out from everywhere else. To so re-bringing it back, it can happen slowly. But the Constitution under Article 340 and Article 351 says that 
Hindi shall be the official language along with English, English temporarily, but Hindi shall be the Rajvasha, that means interstate communication language, but its vocabulary will be drawn from Sanskrit. And over the years, as more and more Sanskrit words come into Hindi, it will become Sanskrit. Sanskrit has to come back. It has to be revived as a means of interstate communication. All words, I mean the Sanskrit words are there in all languages. Sanskrit uh, uh, script, uh, uh, that is Devanagari, is used by many languages. Marathi uses it, Nepal uses it, Nepali uses it, Hindi uses it of course, and Sanskrit uses it. And other uh, scripts are also very similar. Because they all come from Brahmi. Tamil itself has 40% words which are Sanskrit. On that I had to dispute once with Karnanasi. He said, no, not a single word. We are pure Tamil. So I said, how come your name is Karnanidhi? That is pure Sanskrit. Why don't you change that? So I am saying to you that this, these unifications which we found, we were a decentralized country. Decentralization in everything. Religion also decentralization. There was no one pope sitting telling you. This decentralization has been mistaken for thinking that we are, we were never one country. The British made us one country. There are people who speak like that. But that is not true. We are being one country. Whenever a crisis came, we came together. Once in my trip to China, the Chinese leaders asked me, how do you explain the spontaneous uh, nationalism of the Indians in 1962? I said, why do you ask this question? They said, you see, we thought that if we give a big blow, India will break up into 20 countries. That was the propaganda. But on the opposite we saw, Indians became more united. Women took off their gold bangles and started putting it for defense, for defense purposes. We have never seen such, that is why we decided that we cannot go on with this war and they unilaterally stopped the war and uh, pulled back because they saw this rising uh, uh, nationalism. Indians don't flaunt their nationalism, but deep down the heart of every Indian who is not otherwise brainwashed is a person who identifies himself with the whole country. That's why in our pujas we identify every part of India. And we go on, uh, people from South India go all the way to Vaishnadevi or, uh, or to uh, Kedarnath and Badrina because this was our way of establishing the unity. So, first principle is know your correct history. And that correct history is we were always one country. The UNESCO now accepts that out of 46 civilizations in the world, 45 had disappeared, like the Greeks and the Egyptians and the Romans. But only one has survived, and that is the Hindu civilization of India. When we uh, became independent, we ought to have gone to our traditional ways of thinking. Agriculture was so important because the British had built it. But what did we find? That we adopted the Soviet economic model, which was totally unsuited for India. Soviet economic model was based in by Stalin on the principle that you extract resources from agriculture and finance industrialization. But there were no resources in agriculture. They were, uh, they were uh, already bled completely dry by the British through the Zamindari system. So we should have gone in for developing the agriculture along with industrialization and not focus on industrialization alone, the heavy industrialization that Jawaharlal Nehru wanted. It failed. Country began to suffer famines, or at least near famines. One for failure in the rainfall, country had shortage of food pairs. At one stage in 1965, we had to wait for one ship to come from America to get some wheat. That was the situation. 
And after Lal Bahadur <coughs> Shastri took over, he brought in the package for 10% of the farmers and then we got what is called as Green Revolution. That 10% with the help of a uh, measured amount of water, electricity, uh, fertilizers, good seeds, transformed Indian agriculture and we stopped being dependent on imports for food. But just with that 10%, now if we do for the 100%, we will be, we will be a booming economy. All our agricultural products today are the cheapest in the world. The price of wheat is one fourth that in America. The price of basmati rice is, of that quality rice, is one sixth of that in Japan and South Africa. The price of milk is one fourth that in Europe. And we have got plenty to produce more. We have the only country in the world which can grow crops all 12 months of the year in three seasons. You're in America, there's snowfall for five months, so there's no agriculture during that period. Same thing in Europe. Even China, good parts of it are under snow. But in India, you get sunshine, water, uh, rain, all through the year. And therefore you can grow three crops a year. But we grow only 25% of our land, we grow more than one crop. Gross mis underutilization of our resources. We have 150 million cows in our country. Today it is now recognized all over the world that the Indian cow, which is called Boss Indicus, that breeds milk has got a maximum medicinal value. Today in American supermarkets, if you go to America, please go to the supermarket and see that along with the American cattle milk, there is a separate counter in supermarkets for what they call as A2 milk. And if you read it, it says A2 milk, milk from Boss Indicus, the breed found in India only. And that milk is priced four times the American milk price. In our country, we hardly produce any. Look, uh, I mean, the milk we produce, they are all emaciated. 150 million cows, the average the yield for them is only 200 liters. One Israeli cow, well-fed Israeli cow, gives you 11,000 liters a year. Imagine if 150 million cows of India gave you 11,000 liters of milk, then I can, don't have to come by plane to Bombay, I can come swimming in milk. That much milk we have in our country. So, now, consequently, our economy has got tremendous potential. If, if, if you follow the proper economic policies. Our Prime Minister has focused on micro-projects and he's done quite well in that. Whether it is in the question of Ujjwala where he has replaced uh, burning goods and causing, bringing tears to the eyes of a woman who cooks food to bringing, giving her cylinders. But these are micro uh, projects. But what we need now is a new kind of macroeconomic policy. And that macroeconomic policy must be of a different type, where you encourage the people, people to, to do the right thing. Supposing we abolish income tax, I am telling you the country will be so enthused that they will save that money and you will get more money for investment and corruption will come down very sharply. And who's paying the income tax today? And nobody in agriculture pays income tax, by the way. Nobody in the, below the poverty line pays income tax. Rich people have chartered accountants, so it's, everything goes in expenses and they hardly pay any taxes. <laughs> the middle class, they are the ones who are the targets. And all those nasty, so I am in the favor of abolishing income tax. So where will you get all the money? How much money? Four lakh crores is the revenue from income tax. One option of 2G gave you four lakh crores. <laughs> now after 2G, 5G is coming. After 2G, 3G is coming. 4G is coming. 5G is coming. And now they are doing research on 6G. G means generation, by the way. For long years, when I once first, when I was doing this court case in, 
in the Supreme Court uh, and in 2G, 2G it was coming. So one day I ran into my old friend, uh, Mr. Na, then Prime Minister Manmohan Singh, I asked him, do you know what this 2G is? He said, yes, Sonia G and Rahul G. <laughs> I said, no, 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 I'm talking, about, I'm talking about in the spectrum case. He said, no, 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 this is all I need to know. <laughs> that is, the fact is, you can get any amount of money by auction of natural resources. Coal, we have still not fully started auctioning coal blocks. You'll get 11 lakh crores. There is 4 lakh crores of income tax revenue and for 11 lakh crores. And there's every year you can have the option. If you did, but we didn't do it, I agree with you, we didn't do it, we promised to do it. But that doesn't mean we won't do it if you give us one more chance. <laughs> there was 120 lakh crores of black money abroad. That can be brought back. Many countries have brought their money back. Egypt has brought Mubarak's money from abroad. Libya has brought Gaddafi's money from abroad. Philippines has brought uh, Marcos' money from abroad. So therefore, I'm saying that this country is not short of resources. It is the way you organize your economy that can make the change. You want new India, the more you allow people to do their thing, the more you encourage them, the better it will be. Soviet economic model where everything was under compulsion. Our growth rate didn't increase three and a half percent. And what happened when Nasima Rao came? I was also given a minister at a cabinet rank position in his government to help him on WTO and economic reforms. That growth rate went up from three and a half percent to eight percent in just five years. But remember, Narsimha Rao lost the elections and badly lost the elections. Economic reform alone, economic progress alone will not get you elections. You will not get elections. For elections you need some sentimental issues. All through our history, the Moraji Desai brought the best price stability in the history of India. Sugar price had come down to two, two rupees a kilo. But Janata Party's strength became one-tenth what it was in 1977. Because people were angry that we broke up. The sentiment on that made the difference. Similarly, in the case of Nasimha Rao, he had brought economic reforms, but those who lost money because import controls and licenses disappeared, and so they couldn't earn black market money, they began campaigning with the people that this is all for rich people. And people fell for that propaganda and it was defeated. Vajpayee said India shining. And in fact, we have produced very good economic reforms. And we have very good economic results. But Vajpayee's also the BJP strength came down very sharply. We need the economic growth, of course. But it's a necessary condition, it's not enough. In a new India, you need certain things which bind you together and create an emotional fervor for you. And for that, we need to understand how to balance economic growth with other things. Today, we are speaking so much about Ram, Ram Temple. Why? Because people feel strongly about it. Some of our English educated people think that, oh, why is Ram Temple? It is not Ram Temple, it is Ram Janma Bhumi Temple. They where Ram was born. Faith tells us that Ram was born at a particular spot. And there was a temple there before. And therefore we want we want that temple to be returned. It was destroyed by Baba's agent, Mir Baki, who destroyed it and built Babri Masjid. So we want now a Ram temple where originally Ram Lala temple stood. And we are fighting for it. Of course, there were many, many temples which were destroyed by Islamic invaders. I mean, uh, according to my list, there were 40,000. But we are only asking for three. 
Ayodhya is Ram temple. People say, how do you know that Ram was born there? I said, faith says. And I asked them, do you know where Christ was born? They said, Bethlehem. I said, how do you know? He said, no, 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 I mean, everybody knows that. I said, no, you tell me, how do you know? Most people don't know. The mother of King Constantine of Rome had a dream that Christ was born in a particular spot and all Christians accepted. And today they say Bethlehem is where he was born. Al-Aqsa Mosque, Muslims believe that Muhammad went to heaven from there on a horse. How can you go to heaven on a horse? <laughs> but they believe it. And therefore it is considered sacred. So we, years and years we have believed this. Guru Nanak came there before Baba's men came and he describes it. And he says this is where Ram was born. And there's a beautiful temple. Now we want this temple. They say you demolished the masjid. Yes, those who demolished it, uh, they are facing uh, criminal court cases. But masjid can be demolished. How do we know that? They demolish. Go to Google and find out whether and write Saudi Arabia and demolished masjid. You will give a long list of masjids because Islam believes masjid is a place for congregation for reading namaz. Namaz can be read anywhere. But it is not a sacred place. It can be demolished, it can be, uh, it can be shifted. When I started arguing in the Supreme Court, saying that my faith tells me that I was born here, which is my fundamental right to pray there and you are blocking me. So please remove these blocks and give, allow me to build a temple. At that time, the question was raised. What about the demolished masjid? What about the Muslims' fundamental rights? I said it has already been decided in 1994 by the Supreme Court of India and the Constitutional Bench that masjid is not an essential part of Islamic religion. It is a place for congregation to read namaz. And masjid can be shifted. Masjid can be broken. During British rule it happened. This is Supreme Court of India. So to counter me, the Congress people said, no, that is only five judges, now we want seven judges to consider it. And so much time has passed. The Supreme Court considered that prayer and said it is not necessary, nothing new will be found. We have once again say that a masjid is not an essential part of Islam. It can be shifted, it can be destroyed. Now today, People are complaining that the courts are taking too much time. We want Ram Temple quickly. I was invited recently to a meeting of sadhus, top sadhus, in an association called Hindu Dharma Acharya Sabha. And that met in Rajkot. I was asked to speak on the Ram Temple matter. And the sadhus were very impatient. The party president, Mr. Ramit Shah, was also there, and the RSS chief, Mohan Bhagat, was also there. And when I was asked to speak, and they said, tell us how it can be done. I said, when Mr. Nasima Rao was prime minister, he was asked by the Supreme Court, which was considering that time <coughs> the outcome and the fallout of the Babri Masjid demolition in a constitutional bench. That Supreme Court constitutional bench asked the Solicitor General, please ask your Prime Minister, what is his solution to this problem? And Nasim Rao then spoke to me, he wrote me a letter afterwards thanking me for the suggestion. He wrote, a, he made out a statement, not an affidavit. Prime Minister doesn't make affidavits. He made a statement which he gave to his Solicitor General to file as his affidavit, in which he said, we, our government is determined to enforce a solution to this problem. And the solution is as follows. If 
it is ever determined that there was previously a temple, there was a pre-existing temple, then the government will hand the land to the Hindus to build the temple. This is what he said. So I am telling our Prime Minister, Narendra Modi, you don't have to go to the Supreme Court. You just tell the Supreme Court that Narasimha Rao <coughs> had mentioned this to you. It was a cabinet decision. Since it was a cabinet decision, it is binding on me. And I suggested, as of today, midnight, you hand that land to the Vishwadha Parishad or the Hindu Dharma Acharya Sabha and say, build a Ram temple and go and inform the Supreme Court. Let the Supreme Court consider the title disputes of whether Sunni Vakuf Board has a title or the uh, Nirmoyi Akhata has a title. But once we build the temple, we can give them compensation. <laughs> and say, your title, your land is gone. Government can take land. Government can have the sovereign power to take any land in this country. And tell them we have taken the land. We are building a temple. We have to do the same thing with Krishna temple also in Mathura and Kashi Vishwanath Temple in, in Varanasi. I told the Muslim community, leave these three and the remainder of the 40,000 we won't touch. This I call as Krishna package. <laughs> so they said, why Krishna package? I said, because when Mahabharata war was about to begin, Krishna left the battlefield, went to Duryodhana. And he said, why this war for nothing? You give five villages to the Pandavas, and you keep Hastinapur, you keep Idrabhastha also. So Duryodhan in his anger said, nothing doing, not even the land which is there in the pin of, the, in the uh, point of the needle, I will not give. So Krishna came back, Draupadi was very angry with him. Why did you go and make this deal? He said, because I want to show the world that how unreasonable he was. And now we can go to war. It will be a just war. The same way, give me three or I take 40,000. <laughs> this country became free in 1947 as a Hindu country. Let me remind everybody. We said those Muslims who don't want to leave India, they are free to stay. But there was no requirement. In fact, Ambedkar said himself that uh, 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 that uh, they should be population exchange. That's the logical end of this thing determined. That time the Congress party which was in command said no, any Muslim who wants to stay can stay. That doesn't mean that we are going to start a new culture for this country. This is a land of a continuing Hindu civilization in which many religions live peacefully. We are not going to impose on anybody. In Saudi Arabia, can you build a temple? No. In Saudi Arabia, can you celebrate Diwali? No. Can, in Saudi Arabia, can you recite, uh, have Satya and Puja inside your house? No. In Saudi Arabia, can you display a picture of Ram Chandraji in your pocket? No, there's punishment for it. That, when I asked the Saudi Arabian leaders, is that a bit unreasonable? They said, that's our religion. You don't have to come to Saudi Arabia. We are not saying like that, you can't have a masjid. We are not saying that, uh, yes, of course, if you go on reading namaz on the road, we can say, no, you can't, you're causing for a traffic jam, we can't allow that. That we can do. But we are not preventing anybody from practicing their religion. That is the greatness of Hinduism. So I am saying to you today, we need what is called in Sanskrit as Punarutan. That is, we need a renaissance. We need a India, continuing civilization of India, but in new form. There are many things that have been replaced. They have become ossified. The Varna system was never originally meant
to be birth based. Brahmins were those who were jnanis and tyagis. They had to be both. Kshatriyas fought for the country and to protect it. Then those who created wealth and were respected if they donated more than what they needed. Then there were those who tilled the soil or the shudras. The scheduled caste, as it is called, were a very small number. They increased in number after the Buddhist rule and then especially after the Islamic rule in numbers. But their children were never scheduled caste. Valmiki was born of scheduled caste parents. In the beginning he was a Dabbait. Later he became a Maharishi. He wrote the Ramayana. Veda Vyasa's mother was a fisherwoman. He is the one who wrote the Mahabharata, I mean the Gita, the Mahabharata. Similarly, um, uh, like, like uh, uh, Valmiki wrote the Ramayana, Veda Vyasa wrote the Mahabharata. Kalidasa was a Varvasi, he was cutting branches of trees, he became Maharishi, the poet of poets. Vishwamitra, the Rishi of Rishis, was born in a Kshatriya family. If you are to be called a Brahmin, you may be born in a Brahmin house, but unless you are a Jnani and a Tyagi, you don't qualify to be a Brahmin. It depends on, it was a decentralization of power that two Rishis, Brigyu and Bhagavad are devised. Unfortunately, this got connected with birth for some, some unknown reason. Bhagavad Gita, Krishna very clearly says it's got nothing to do with birth. It's got to do with gunas. It's there in the Gita. I'm not making this up. So, we need now unity. It means rising above all these differences. And regarding ourselves as one. And that can only come when we participate as equals in every process. Our country, by the way, culturally has always been, is been always a democratic country. It's a country where democracy is in our blood. And the best example of that is 1977. When Indira Gandhi declared elections, I was that time in America. All my American friends said, don't go back. Democracy is meant for people with full stomachs and fully educated people. You will, you will not win that election. Mrs. Gandhi is in total control. And what did the elections of 1977 show? The most illiterate parts of India voted Mrs. Gandhi out and the most literate parts of the four southern states of India, they voted for Mrs. Gandhi. The literate people voted for Indira Gandhi the illiterate of UP, Bihar, Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh wiped her out and defeated her also in the constituency. That's because of this culture of ours which has been basically democratic. So we must celebrate that and that can be only celebrate if we now bring about a change, a modernization, a renaissance in our <coughs> cultural system. And for that we need to view, view the whole thing in a totally different perspective. We must be proud of our past, we must know what our past is, we must know what is the bad points and the good points. And having done that, we must rise to see that we know our traditions and how we believe. Today, I gave wherever I go, I am told, we don't treat our women well. That is not a fault of the Hindus. If you go back, I would say Hindus probably treated their men a little worse than women. Because when Brahma formed his cabinet, he gave all the important portfolios to women. Finance to Lakshmi, education to Saraswati, defense to Dhruga, and not, nothing to the male gods, only one, I remember. And that was, that was information broadcasting to Narad Muni. <laughs> When Draupadi said there shall be war, there was a war. Because of her humiliation, she insisted on war, she got the war. Sita 
said, I will not leave Asura Shokvatika on the back of Hanuman. Hanuman came and offered her. She said, sit on my back, I'll take you. Ram is grieving for you. She said, no, he has to come here and kill this demon and, and liberate all these women he has converted into slaves. And that was the characterization of it. Now we have forgotten it. It doesn't mean that this is Hinduism is like that. It was the most self-renewing religions in the world. And it's a religion which is believed in decentralization. Therefore, our economy, our society, everything was put together on essentials. But got complete freedom to develop your own individual ingenuity. This was the system which we had, and this is the social system we must have if we want a genuine new India. Thank you very much. Do more questions? I will ask the motion to sort out nothing. The history taught in the school to young minds is flawed, isn't it? And these young minds, the future citizens, will decide the course of our nation. Isn't there a need for course correction of the history taught in the schools? Absolutely correct. In fact, our government has uh, tried to do that. The problem is, you call five scholars, sit down and say, okay, history book has to be written. To find unanimity in scholars is not easy. We have got a draft, so there's a lot of disagreement. And I don't think that uh, five years is enough to change the history books. So you better give us one more term to write in there. Yes, I know. It has just been passed in Lok Sabha because we have majority. I was coming to Rajya Sabha. Well, we'll have to do a little tigram, but we'll get it passed there also. <laughs> and this is the first step. The next step is Halala, uh, which is a terrible concept. I don't know if you people know about it. Uh, please find out. I don't think it's humanly wise to even think about such things, but it's somehow been a practice. Then after that, inheritance system. We have all these reforms we have brought into the Hindu community from 1954. The Hindu court bill was that. The Hindus didn't protest. But uh, I don't understand why anybody should protest. And uh, they, we have to ensure that men and women get equal opportunity under the law. And so this is the first step. And then after that, uh, many more steps will be taken to see that uh, men in every religion uh, and have the same rights as women. Yeah. What steps need to be taken 
to make Indian agriculture to be a vibrant economic activity for ensuring prosperity at village levels. This is Mr. Ravindra Kalpanis. All you have to do is to empower agriculturists to export their goods. That means you give them the infrastructure for that. You must create small, small airports in every place so that freight can be taken to the next nearest uh, port from which the ships can take it. You must create cold storages. You must have packaging industries. We produce the best flowers in the world, but we don't get anything for it. Whereas Amsterdam produces inferior flowers compared to us, but they are the world uh, marketers of uh, uh, marketing experts of, of, of uh, flowers. So, India has all that, but you want the farmers to prosper, they must get a high price, that cannot be done by the government, by subsidizing, that is, that is not a workable proposition. Enable farmers to become uh, exporters, nowadays you can be an exporter through the internet, teach them how, we have seen already in Green Revolution, we taught them a simple fact about how to combine uh, nitrogen, phosphate, and uh, and uh, sulfuric acid together, and uh, and uh, how to put the seeds, how to put the water. You got, got a green revolution. Our people can learn very fast if you make the opportunities available, but make the farmer stand on his own feet because he's producing the produce at such cheap rates. And then, of course, you must also fight in the WTO to prevent these countries from putting a bar or a, a high tariff and fight for it, like uh, Trump is fighting for his country, you should also learn to fight, to see that the farmer becomes an exporter. That's the only way the farmer's life can improve. There is a question from, uh, questions from Mr. Madhusudan Arki. How much should India have GFT and how to avail it, that is one. How much is the ideal reserve required by RBI? <laughs> and is farmer debt waiver a solution? Do you have questions? Well, the farmer debt waiver, I mean, who who gets the loan? Uh, I would say that most, about 40% of our farmers are uh, tenant farmers. And the land doesn't belong to them. The land belongs to somebody living in the city. And he has uh, allowed these uh, people on hire. He's treated them as landless laborers. And so when you waive a, a loan, you are not necessarily benefiting only farmers. You are benefiting people who are sitting in cities and enjoying the fruits of the farming community. Only way to benefit the farmer, as I told you, is enable him to export his products, either to any part of India or any part of the world. Assist him in that, give the infrastructure for that, you will have an agricultural revolution in no time. Our RBI, how much resources? As much as reserves, as much as a good Reserve Bank governor thinks is appropriate, and uh, not the present governor, uh, but uh, I think it's, uh, it's wrong to take the surpluses of the Reserve Bank and use it for finance ministry budgeting. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. You can send me an email. Right? <laughs> um, this is very uh, important, important question. What is the impact of not building Ram Mandir before 2019 Lok Sabha election? <laughs> what? Ah, well, you asked me this question in uh, May of 2019 because I think we are going to build the Ram Temple by hook or crook. Meena, Meena Jaisinghani is asking a simple question. According to you, what are the chances of Modi government to come in power? Well, I mean, Modi government means BJP, no? Uh, <laughs> BJP government, 100% uh, certain they will come to power. Because even this time we lost in the assembly elections, it was a very, very narrow margin in terms of votes. And let me tell you, 
in uh, 1997, Congress won most of the uh, 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 regional elections there, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, all of them they won. And then in 1998, the NDA won and Vatar Bihari Vajpayee became the Prime Minister. Similarly, uh, in uh, other occasions also, so the state elections doesn't necessarily show what will happen in the national election, but I will say even the state election, the margin was so narrow, except for Chhattisgarh, that that's a small state, but uh, except for that state, both Rajasthan and uh, uh, Madhya Pradesh is a very narrow margin and we can reverse it without difficulty and we are bound to therefore uh, come to power in 2019 in, in terms of the number of seats we get in Lok Sabha from these states. Uh, Mr. Devdas Nair is asking, can you highlight on your fight against foreign ownership of print and electronic media? <laughs> I don't know how this news has spread because I am not fighting on that on a, on a blanket basis. What happened is that the Hindu newspaper uh, had uh, um, uh, an editor who was holding an American passport. So, and he was also a communist, so that also I didn't like. So, therefore, <coughs> I asked the Hindu newspaper management, you know, how can you have an American uh, printing, uh, a, you know, being an editor of an Indian paper, uh, <laughs> paper in, uh, disseminating information in India? They didn't agree. So I went to court and then he had to resign. Now somebody has played mischief and made out as if I had gone to Supreme Court and all that. I went to Delhi High Court and got it done. Today the law is that nobody in the, um, uh, what is called as visual media, there's a television and uh, so on, can be a foreign citizen and, and an editor. But as far as print media is concerned, the law is not clear. I got that cleared up by going to court. And I don't think that foreigners should be editors of newspapers in India. I don't think they should be part of the uh, TV broadcast in India. Uh, they, they can be owners, I don't mind, but the editor must be an Indian. Uh, Mr. Mahindra Rajapaksha is Sri Lanka. He uh, is uh, consistently anti-India. <laughs> so... I don't agree that he's anti-India. Okay, do you uh, want to know your take on him? No, he is not anti-India. In fact, he killed the LTT. That's the most pro-India thing anybody could do for us. The, 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 the organization which killed Rajiv Gandhi and created terrorism in, in Tamil Nadu, he finished them off. Uh, and therefore, what I, I would say that is a great benefit for our country. He is a bit of a nationalist, and, uh, but uh, there is nothing that India has wanted which he has said, no, I will not give to you. That Human Tata port, which is often quoted, India was offered that first. Manmohan Singh wanted to do it, but Karnanidhi said, no, you cannot do it because Karnanidhi was pro-LTT and uh, therefore uh, he didn't allow India to build that Hamantata port. And the Chinese immediately came and said, why you want a loan from India? We will give you a grant and we will build it for you. And yet people are going on saying that he has given China, China uh, Hamantata port. It was offered to us first. Even now, he will, if India goes and says that you don't have to have Chinese, uh, so much Chinese in your management thing, we will supply and it will be cheaper also because they are coming from next door. He will be happy to do it, but of course he's, uh, only in the next election he is going to win and come back as the Prime Minister. And at that time, uh, you can, if the government of India is not able to do it, they can ask me, I will get it done. <laughs> This is a very interesting question, sir. Mr. Asked by Mr. Manoj Patil. National Herald case. Yeah. Yeah. Will the result come before 2019? Well, I am uh, going to be, I am the complainant. I have given all the evidence. Now my cross examination will take place on January 11th. and should be over by January 30th. 
And then uh, after that, uh, I will need some evidence, uh, some other witnesses necessary. Then there will be arguments on framing of charges. And that once that is done, everything is on documents. It has been proved, it has, the High Court has upheld all my allegations. And uh, I would think that definitely in the middle of April, you should see Sonia Gandhi in jail. Oh, wow. <laughs> Let me also say there is no doubt in my mind that neither Sonia Gandhi nor Rahul Gandhi can ever become Prime Ministers of India. Why? I tell you why also. Rahul Gandhi in 2004 took British citizenship and I have got those papers and I have given it to the Lok Sabha Ethics Committee which is headed by Mr. Advani to say that please uh, under Article uh, 9 of the Constitution excuse me, yes, Article 9 of the Constitution which says that no Indian citizen can have the citizenship of any other country Therefore, and if he does, his Indian citizenship will be automatically cancelled. Cancel Rahul Gandhi's. Uh, now, Mr. Arwani is moving very slowly, so maybe I will now put a little bomb under his table so that he <laughs> will faster. But she also tried to become Prime Minister in 2004, but I, and, uh, I went to Mr. Uh, Abdul Kalam. And he was courageous enough to tell her that he cannot administer uh, the uh, oath of office to her because there is a rule in our Citizenship Act that if an Italian or any foreigner becomes a citizen of India, he or she will be subject to the same restriction an Indian becoming a citizen in their country is subject to. An Indian becoming a citizen by naturalization in Italy cannot be Prime Minister of Italy because he is not born in Italy. And the same way applying it to Sonia Gandhi, she was not born in India, so she can never be Prime Minister of India. So, you don't have to worry. Uh, I will take care. I will send them to jail. Don't worry about that. But it has no effect on the election as far as they are becoming Prime Minister. I will also send Chidamaram to jail in a much longer sentence. So this is my question. Sending this uh, Gandhi family members, uh, Ms. Sonia and uh, Rauji, and Rahul, <laughs> in jail, would that help them as a sympathy way in the election? That is your fault, not my fault. I will do my duty and send them to jail. You want to have sympathy for them, then you will have my sympathy. <laughs> Congress seems to be setting the narrative where BJP is trying to desperately respond. Congress is able to get away with lies and BJP struggles. Despite of so many things in your favor, you struggle. Where is BJP failing? I don't struggle. But uh, it is Amit Shah who has to select the party spokesman. Please ask him. Why doesn't he ask me to answer them? I'll answer them practically. <laughs> This is the last question. I mean, there are so many. Is there any hope for reviving our education uh, medium as mother tongue, as very basis of our socio-economic prosperity of Bharat? Mother tongue should be encouraged at all levels. But I want every language for technical subjects to use as many Sanskrit words as possible. And I would like also Sanskrit to be made compulsory so that every Indian knows Sanskrit as a link language between that state and Thank you very much. There are many questions I could take as I, I tried. Thank you.